I am Ann Hamilton. Welcome to Always Subject to Change. And I'm Johanna Burton, Director of the Wexner Center for the Arts. Today we're delighted to be joined by Dina Hagag. Dina is the President and CEO of United States Artists, a national arts funding organization doing the crucial work of providing direct, unrestricted support and funding to artists and cultural practitioners in a variety of fields, including film, design, dance, theater, and more. Never is that work more urgent, essential, and imperiled than at a time like this. We're eager to discuss Dina's remarkable work and how that takes shape in the face of the dual crises of the pandemic and systemic racism. And again, we're just so happy to have you here, Dina. So thank you for joining us today. So full, dis full disclosure, I am on the board of United States Artists and that's how I first met Dina who came in at quite an extraordinary time. It was, I think you interviewed for the position just as um, the last election results were announced. Mm -hmm. And um, it became almost immediately a very different context for the arts. But I think before, I think before we address maybe this particular moment, I wanna back up a little bit into your history, Dina. And, that before you came to United States Artists and the work of uh, contributing really to making the funding ecology to support the arts broadly, you were curating. And you were curating in New York and you ran a uh, institution, the Contemporary in Baltimore. And that institution didn't have a home, right? It was, it was mobile. It, it didn't have an architectural space. And so it allowed a kind of um, out of necessity, a kind of nimbleness to mm -hmm. commission work, to make the context for work to be seen. And I would love to hear you address the, like what you learned from that shift from the nimbleness of directing a program that was always changing and how it ties to this moment. Yeah, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, it, so in Baltimore, the Contemporary was a nomadic museum. And in the four years I was there, the commissions that we did were in borrowed spaces. And so I think there was first and foremost, the nimbleness it takes to work. And, and excuse me, those commissions during my tenure were all with a single individual artist uh, that we invited to imagine and implement a project at a site in the city. And I think one thing about it that I think was such a learning and I think I've carried it USA and I'm, I'm now wondering a lot about it given the current context of our country. But you know, the thing that you also have to be really nimble with wasn't just the site, it was the people, right? It was literally the neighborhood, um, the residents, the businesses in this place where an artist was about to spend an inordinate amount of time and where we were about to enter, always invited, like that was very important to the way that we worked at the contemporary. But I think it was learning, it was admitting and learning that the city of Baltimore spoke more than one vernacular, that there was not a single way to make an art project in the city because there was not a single resident or inhabitant of the city, that the city was like dozens of tiny microcosms and we were trying to respond to them in different ways. And I think more importantly, it was also admitting that one project we did in one area wouldn't necessarily resonate with the last mm. community we worked with and that that was okay. And at the time, our artistic director, Ginevra Shea, who's brilliant, would say things like, you know, can you make a project that is really just for an audience of 15 or an audience of 500 or just for this group of people? And, and does that teach our audiences at the Contemporary to participate without having it be predominantly for them. And I think something about learning that you can have more than one audience, that you can prioritize people differently and that an artist could help make those narratives was important. And I love that about USA. I think it's why I love that we serve every discipline and every part of the nation and all kinds of artists. It reminds me that there is not a single cultural for in the US that something that's very important to a painter in New York is phenomenally irrelevant to a violinist in South Dakota or a basket weaver in Sitka, and that that's okay. And that what we're in charge of is building something that exists in close relation and interdependence to one another, but that they don't, that we can be different and together. Um, mm -hmm. So 
sorry if that's remarkably incoherent, but I've been, it was really tough. And then I also want to name just while we're here, before we move on away from it, you know, Baltimore is a tough city. Baltimore is a phenomenally under-resourced, segregated city. Baltimore has been abandoned mm -hmm. by a lot of very powerful people, both there and beyond. And I think what is an art project in a city like that? What does it even mean? What is the value of it? And I think I'm so grateful to have learned to have come up against some of those questions um, in advance of the predicament we now find ourselves in. Right, because right now those questions are very much in the fore. There's, um, so you're raising money to support individual artists yeah. um, who are experiencing different states of emergency. Yep. And, and yet you're challenged every day to make a case for the importance of the arts in the face of all the other emergencies going on. Yeah. And, and I think how you find the language really yeah. to, to do that is really in part through the stories of individual lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, at the, I guess this really is not a question. <laughs> But, but it's like, I, I do think that about how we insist that, um, I think both in, in, oh, I think we expect art to do something. And maybe that need to address different uh, questions, challenges in a community in Baltimore, you know, we, we need to show that it has an effect yeah. that there's there's something that it does yeah. and then and that 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 doesness of it sort of justifies it being and yet that isn't really how art necessarily works yeah. but i think if we had to frame it that way and for me i think increasingly it's that art is just a long-term investment right it is a long-term investment in the literal survival of your civilization mm -hmm. and you might actively not feel the effect of it right now it's funny, I was mentioning this a little bit earlier today, but a few friends of mine met to talk about like, what was the point of our art history degrees? Cause there was, you know, on Twitter, there's like these kids are like, should I go to school? Like, is this the right time to get a degree in museum studies in art history? Like, what, why? And it's, it's, a, it's an important question to ask. And we were all art history degree holders and we were like, oh, what was the point of that thing? And it was funny as, you know, at the end of the day, the thing, we said out loud was, you know, taking art history made me feel like I was learning about my country for the first time. Mm. There was this sanitized victor's tale I learned in high school. And then there was learning directly from artists that were alive during very seminal moments in the making of this place. And I think if we leave no record of this, then truly, truly all of this was in vain. The lives lost, the fights fought it what was the point of all of this if there isn't some record so that a hundred years from now better people exist than us you know mm -hmm. more prepared people than us and so right now I don't know how to answer the question about protecting artists in the middle of such a state of global emergency but I do know that we're doing it because I have to believe that we're we belong to other people that we haven't met yet to a civilization that will need to unearth all of this Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating to be talking now. Did you watch any portion of the RNC? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's happening in live time. Yeah. History is being rewritten in live time. And it, someone has to leave a record. And I will fight like hell for those folks to leave that record. And not just what physically happened, but what it felt like. Because I think that will matter more. You know? Dina, it's interesting. One, one reason that Anna and I started doing these conversations was um, we really felt like... Um, you know, something that we share is an investment in the process, maybe more than the product of totally. the artist's work. And I was looking at some materials in advance of our discussion um, today and realizing that something you and I share is that I never have identified as a maker. I'm not a maker, I'm not an artist, but I um, am totally committed to artists. But from this perspective, that isn't about how I identify with that making, because I'm not a maker. I mean, I, I, facili I facilitate the frameworks um, through a variety of means, writing, curating, institution building. And I was interested as somebody who has talked that way yourself, um, how you might talk about the, the prompt for this, um, for this conversation series was, how, how do we make at moments like this? And how yeah. do we think about that making? And, uh, and in this moment, I think about people like you and I, we are, we're makers in our own way, but again, we're making um, 
we're facilitating space and we're administrating space. So can you talk about what that kind of original prompt that you're the first non-artist we've had on the show? Um, and I'd be curious to hear you talk about, um, you know, from the perspective of a non-maker, how you're making and how you're um, framing, because I do think it's different right now, and but also the same as it's yeah. ever been. Yeah. So a few, yeah. I mean, there's, this has been, yeah. So I think a few things. I think right now, it's also been really interesting to actually make the leap from, I, I wonder a lot what my work would be now if I was still in Baltimore as a contemporary. Yeah. If I was yeah. still in the mode of presenting, of like quite actively and literally making a space versus now at USA where it is very much a different thing. I think that our work at United States Artists and what I think I, alongside of our team, has contributed to is quite actively the 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 making of a financial resource, right? Like the the literal buying people their lives in a weird way. Just here is some space, you know, especially now in a state of emergency in this post-COVID relief mode. And that part of the work is very, very clear, right? It's just, there is a tremendous amount of economic inequity and to some, for whatever reason, in, in my current state of making, I am in a position to uh, translate between two very different audiences, people who have a lot of resources and people who don't and figure out a way to move them. But the more, the harder piece actually this summer has been the making of public will, right? Like that part has been, and it has always vexed us as a field, as a person in my org, it has vexed us. This, how do you better illuminate, justify, articulate, fire up what it means to just remember that we need artists at all, right? Like, how do you do that? And it has never been more damning than right now, right? Because it's not just a question of what does it mean to make art? What does it mean to protect artists in this moment? It is literally a life and death situation for millions of people across the country. And to, to pipe your head up and be like, I'm over here trying to protect artists and have people go, how are you, why artists at a time when so many Americans are struggling? And you're like, oh shit, now we're here. We're officially at the catastrophe point that we all knew we were heading towards, but now we're here. And I think one thing that has been sitting with me this summer a lot is actually how powerful artists are, how grossly generalizing, but how phenomenally educated they are. And sometimes that is through the lens of a four degree institution. Other times that is through deep, deep archival ancestral knowledge, but they are language makers and condition makers and they can fight for something because they've had to fight for themselves their whole lives. And right now we are entering a legislative period in our history where there, the fight is so massive for people's baseline survival. And I think this summer was the first time in my entire career where someone went, what are we doing to protect artists? And I said, oh my God, what are artists doing to protect people? Like actively, what are we doing? Because we don't need another WPA. If we had basic universal health care, we wouldn't have half the applicants in our relief pool. And when you look at the struggle for the gig worker, for all workers, where artists fall on the privilege totem pole of that thing is so high that I think right now I'm like, oh, our condition is people and reminding legislators and politicians and funders and all of the powers that be that an artist has to be at that table. Because not only do they have firsthand experience with having to survive in our nation state, they can articulate it really fucking clearly. Oh, am I allowed to say that? Do we have to pause? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but that, <laughs> sorry. And now I'm like, really, I like, I, I've never felt more damned and frustrated. Like there, there, mm -hmm. there is a fight. There, there is a priority of things. And I actually, for the first time, I don't want to be the one to save the artist. I, it's this, this whole summer of being like, oh, an artist should speak at that thing. An artist should be on that task force. An artist should be part of that report and that commission. Like. And now it's this weird, I struggle to get them there. And I wanna say this blame is not on artists. This blame is on the infrastructure around the artist. And I see myself as a non-maker, as a participant in that infrastructure and trying to figure out how to, why am I at the table to represent artists? Why can't artists be at that table themselves? And I think trying to figure out how to dismantle that a little bit. 
Mm -hmm. You're putting your finger, I think, on the, the kind of primary question of, of people who are in various ways embedded in arts and other institutions right now, which is that we actually have to change the structures themselves. And I yes. think people um, are, are awakening to that, but paralyzed in the face of how to do it. And I'm curious from, a, from the perspective of um, philanthropy, which itself is so embattled right now, right? Like we yeah. need the money and no one, but also everyone's questioning the money. Yep. Um, maybe we could actually talk a little bit about that. Um, we're okay. we're seeing that kind of tension, right? And and I certainly feel it as as someone who runs an institution where we rely on philanthropy in this country for various reasons that um, that are are complex and and not positive um, when there should be uh, state and and federal funding um, for the arts in in ways that there aren't. But there's also a new criticality and. Um, uh, awareness of how philanthropy has relied on certain structures. So can you okay. talk about your, how have you navigated that? It's something that um, you must think about daily and it's interesting from a foundation perspective um, probably to think about it as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been really interesting. I want to name that on record, I, Dina Hagag, personally understand what my job is here. And so I, we have very specific values at United States Artists. And I want to say, I actually, I, in this case, I want to say that I speak on that on behalf of our like 15 person team, right? That there's like a certain line yeah. we have. And if you look just past the veil of that line, all of it gets complicated, all of it, right? Money is complicated. What I think my job is and what has been increasingly difficult in philanthropy, it's my favorite thing about United States Artists is that we are unrestricted. And something about the gesture that the money is not the most important thing at the table feels really liberating. We have artists that give us a hard time about where the money comes from. And if I think part of my work is to absorb that critique on their behalf and to say, I understand and you should take this money anyway and you don't owe us anything for it. There's no pageantry to this. You don't, you're not forced to do anything. The money's not the most important thing at the table. And so take it and go. And it's actually been harder to do this in other contexts where the second a check is cut, it's like that check is the single most important thing. And what would it look like if more donors agreed to be anonymous? Or what would it look like if more artists didn't have to participate in so much of the pageantry around the money itself. Mm -hmm. Last year, we had an artist who asked us if we would consider not naming them in our fellowship. That they just, they needed this money. That was a articulated need, but they didn't want to be named. If we could just say here are 49 artists and one was anonymous, would we still issue the grant? And it, we had to have this whole conversation around that. And what would that mean? And why do we have to? And can't we just redistribute the resource because we believe in the maker, right? And that I think it's my job in philanthropy to reckon with those things, to reckon with the complexity and try as much as I can to keep it away from the artist. And I think that convincing big philanthropy, convincing donors of that is hard. A few years ago, we renamed our fellowship. It used to be the USA Donor Fellow, like you know, the USA Ford Fellow or the USA Duke Fellow. And one of our gestures was to like to take that away and to imagine that what the donors were doing was entering a collective agreement that artists mattered and that they were part of organizing a coalition fund. And we still tell the artists where the money comes from, but we don't force them to carry it with them for the rest of their lives because the art is the thing that's actually more valuable than the money. And so I, I feel like I really believe in resources because I think we're screwed in our field. And I think it will take years to figure out a better infrastructure than this reliance on private philanthropy. So I have no problem being the one that has to sit down at that negotiating table. I think where it starts to get tricky for me is when directors or, and I know it's not easy, but when they lay the responsibility on the artist, it's like, what are all the things the directors could have done that made it so that the artist didn't have to make this moral choice? And with that artist, we still name them, but everything around it was anonymous. They were never connect. Like we asked nothing. We never talked to that artist again. 
And I think in a lot of ways, they appreciated it. It was here's 50K, we never need to hear from you, ever. You don't need to send us a bio or a headshot or anything. And I think those things, they do go a long way. I don't know if that gets to your question. I guess it does. Yeah. It's just the paradox that we're in right now is that, you know, we actually need philanthropy. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and yet I think, you know, there are real questions to be asked about, um, about philanthropy and how it has worked. And so it's, it's just this kind of interesting, I think even within, um, you know, staffs within their institutions have not necessarily even understood how, um, resources ha come in and go out. And, um, so there's an education that I think also, um, to your point, it, it, it should not be laid at the feet of, of necessarily the artists, but really institutions have to make certain kinds of choices. And, and there is within that kind of choice making the opportunity also to um, have different kinds of commitments. From, money needn't be a bad, I mean, it's neither bad nor good. It's, it's just a resource, but yeah. there are ways in which um, kind of understanding sources and outcomes are, are kind of newly keyed. And I'm just, you know, again, and I don't, I don't want to go down this path too far, but, you know, just watching what's happening to museums right now and the kind of um, radical um, self-evaluation that doesn't feel like it's necessarily leading to productive results and it isn't making artists serve necessarily better makes me want to ask questions about, well, how do we, without throwing everything out and starting over, um, which won't articulate anything cleaner necessarily anyway, how, how do we use this moment though, productively mm -hmm. instead of, um, I, I feel like there's just so much frustration on all sides um, at the moment. And so, right. you know, again, we're leaning in at the, at the WEX into things you've named, which is like, you know, um, commitment over time. What does yeah. it mean to say, here's some resources, you'll do something, we're not sure what it is. Yep. Um, but then what is the museum's role um, at that moment? So I don't know, I, that's my, why I wanted to ask the question is I know you've thought about this in various roles and as a funder now you think about it, I think probably in a way that um, is really uh, uh, evocative for those of us running institutions. Yeah. Which you don't fund, which I sort of love. You don't fund institutions, you fund mm -hmm. artists. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but I, I sort of maybe um, joining that question is also um, one of the things United States Artists has really been committed to is, a, a, I would call, a real diversity of practice and geographic location. And so in the group uh, of artists that have been selected through a peer review process that is, I think, very stringent and really central to the ethos of the organization is you have artists that are embedded in their communities in completely different ways. And, and I think, and are supported to different degrees in different ways. And, and I, I would love Dina, because you, you're privy to such a range of uh, models in terms of the artist relationship to where they live or the context in which they work. If you're seeing at this moment, any kind of innovation relative to um, collaborative cooperative efforts that are actually instigated by the artists. Like one yeah. of the things that's unique is that I'm an artist, I'm one of two artists on the board. I feel as an artist, I, I have a voice to contribute and I feel very equal at the table. That's not the common situation in I imagine in a lot of the, the organizations you're working with. Yeah. Yeah. So a few things. Um, it's actually been really beautiful this summer to watch how much mutual aid has happened by artists all over the country for so many different things. And it wasn't just to help other artists, you know, it was artists launching food programs to help their neighbors, bail funds to support incarcerated mothers. I mean, it was just gorgeous. And I think, Something that was happening in those spaces was those artists were just keenly aware of their social capital and like leveraged it to like get things done. Mm -hmm. And we talked to several of those artists because something happened where somewhere along the line, the mutual aid got too big and they needed administrative support. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really, really hard to figure that out. Right. Because many of the artists didn't want these things promoted as these big fancy projects. They did not want to pay obscene fees to have these things managed because their priority was these communities they were serving. And it was actually just really hard to solve that problem. And 
it pointed to all the things that are kind of wrong in our structures, which is the things artists are doing, the way that an artist I think can deploy their social capital is really different than how an institution thinks about collecting that social capital. And something in that translation gets very, very, very confusing. And I think the thing about your board position is that that's an interior space. That is a private space where you can advise and talk and say things. And I think the thing I appreciate about our board is in that private space, things can actually get said. Whether or not they're implemented is another story and how they're executed. Mm -hmm. But I guess, what are the interior spaces institutions make with artists in advisement so that they can hear directly about the why? The why you can't take in my mutual fund and then promote it because this mutual fund is for undocumented people. And if you promote this thing, it's gonna harm the exact people I'm helping. And so either you're gonna take this in and tell no one, and you're gonna do all the labor and tell there's no glory here. There's just work to be done. And I mm. think those things get clogged up because then you tell a board and they're like, well, what do we get out of it? And I think it's like, what more could we be getting out of artists? <laughs> what more do we even need from artists? And I think there's no interior space. And I don't know, this whole summer has literally felt like a hand slap, like, how is that a PR disaster? Was no one at the table to just gently tell someone, no, that, that maybe is a really bad idea. That's gonna alienate a lot of artists. That's gonna alienate a lot of audiences. And I can't figure out where this interiority is that like, and I'm on a few museum boards and there are no artists at the table and it makes a difference. It really makes a difference. And I think, I, I think if we are to reimagine anything, it's governance, and I think the artists who are in those roles, and Anne, it is something I appreciate deeply about you and Natalie Diaz and Rosa Bordelon are the two other artists on our board, that it's a responsibility. You have to speak up at that table. And like that's the one room your social capital really matters. And you can say the thing that everyone needs to hear and they'll hear it differently. And I think on some of the boards I am on, I try to be that voice, but it's not the same as the artist. And it's, which is a good thing. I appreciate that. Um, but I do think artists are imagining a lot of things and we have to let them lead. Someone yesterday on a call I was on said, the world is shrinking. It's just happening. It's not coming back. So can we shrink as gracefully as possible? Like what really are the things we're willing to save now? Because we're not, none of us are going back to the way things were. And so what does that mean? And I think more so than any other group I know, artists have always been doing things in this state of shrinkage and like figuring out how to do it right and gracefully. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm really frustrated with philanthropy. Maybe this is the place to really say that out loud because I actually think the thing the philanthropists want and the thing the artists want and the thing the audiences need are actually all the same. It's the same thing, but how we think about social capital is not the same. And then that mm -hmm. gets really tripped up. And I'm really curious about a new art world without the gala, without the art fair, without, not, not at the way we did it, without the country club. What does that look like? And yeah, it's weird. It's like, I think all these groups just want intimacy, like equally, and they're just doing it all differently. Yeah, I mean, do, do you think that, um, you know, there's obviously been such a value on, um, how many bios do you read internationally, you know, exhibited yeah. or like the international artists and the, the kind of biennials and all of the different um, venues that have multiplied really over until recently. Yeah. And, and it seems like, you know, one thing that we're talking a lot about here um, is what does it mean to be a local artist? You know, that was yeah. a that was actually a term that had a really negative connotation for a long time. Like you're only mm -hmm. local. Yep. And I, I think one of the things that's interesting about so many of the artists who have been supported through United States artists or who um, have been commissioned to do projects that they, um, have connections to community that many artists have lost. And I think now we're really looking for um, a way for the art to have meaning, yeah. um, you know, in that exchange with someone they might actually be able to stand in front of, at least on a Zoom screen. No. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I do think this, this 
this desire for intimacy, this scaling of things has been such a question for a really long time. Um, is it better because 500,000 people come yeah. or is 15 okay? And, and the, the, the perversion of scale on so many levels of production in this culture have then also perverted the relationships or the, the impulse for the work to be made in the first place. And so, so some of this also feels like a recovery. And, you know, not to be like, oh, let's look at this positively. I don't mean that. But it is about like an examination of core values, right? And now how do we act on that? And how do we, as Johanna says, how do we make now? Right. And, and so what does that, what kinds of institutions do we need is, is, is an architecture now irrelevant? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the, what it takes to support that architecture requires an economy that is unsustainable right now. Yeah. You know, it's really funny. We never commissioned a local artist at the contemporary on purpose. Hmm. And I regret that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we thought our work was to resource local artists, and we did. You know, we did grants, equipment loans, retreats, studio visits. I mean, we were definitely a friend to the local artist. And I think we worked our asses off to make sure they had what they needed to excel in their practices. Mm -hmm. But I remember in the decision-making room around the big commissions, right, where we were really going to put resources, mm -hmm. I remember saying things like, these artists have shown here so much. There's nothing we can do to help their career from here, right? So we brought all the artists in from the outside to put some kind of like sheen on the city and on our institution. And then we hoped that as the museum grew and as our profile grew, we could just continue to keep resourcing local artists. But it really was, we treated the commissions like they were for an audience and then for an artist's career, which is really different than it being for the artist directly. And I regret that. Like I regret the way we thought about the opportunity of a commission, not the practice and the process of one. Mm. And I think that in retrospect, I'm like, what were we thinking? There are so many promising artists in Baltimore and we did a lot to connect them to other institutions to get work done but to afford them the time and the space in a city they knew to really think of something that they could not do without the support of an institution. We didn't do that and it was a mistake. And I think now looking back on it, I'm like, damn, like what were we? And I think it's again, this perversion of the career of the internationally renowned of the, like that's part of our work too. And I think now in a new world, what is the point of a career? Like, what is the, what does it do? Who is it for? And what does it do? And what will it matter? And in, in later, I don't know. I don't know what fame will matter, you know? I feel like I, I remember that point in my curatorial career where, um, and this is a gross um, generalization, but where I sort of knew the pool of artists that everybody was going to show. Like, yeah. Artists mm -hmm. show all over the country mm -hmm. and you could kind of see that emergent swing and and it wasn't that it wasn't a, a great um a great pool of artists but it was sort of like somehow everybody kind of mutually recognized the same kind of emergent um group of of artists and then they kind of showed everywhere and they yep. did some version of what they did everywhere everywhere yep. and the exhaustion of that was partially about um, people having really very quickly to have to adjust to being acknowledged, right? And so suddenly, and, and I, I think we've all had, or at least I have that fear of you'll never be asked again. So you'll give a thousand lectures in a row because you don't want to say no. And I think artists got on those, um, you know, kind of got on those cycles. But I think, you know, and I was on a call yesterday, I'd be curious to know, Dina, what, you, what you've been hearing, but I think there's a massive shift in people's desire to get on that, to get on that cycle. You know, yesterday an artist said to me, oh, well, um, we were never asked to the table, but I actually don't want to sit at your table. Not to me personally, but I, <laughs> I don't want to sit at your table anymore. We've made, yeah. made our Yeah. And that table's more interesting. Um, yeah. And so I'm, it's interesting. I wonder if um, as institutions 
whether funding institutions or programming institutions, you know, that, that sort of um, generic trade of the same artists, again, no matter how wonderful they are, may, um, may have kept us from seeing what was really happening, yeah. like under the, um, in, in all of these places where I think finally people are, are sort of like, well, actually we can just do this. Um, and they have been for a long time, but I think there's a different kind of connectivity and, and um, uh, people help each other and don't think about themselves as single authors, maybe in the same way. And I just, I wonder how we then shift as entities that are, do we become irrelevant or do, yeah. we, do we radically shift to kind of approximate that? And if people no longer think we're the framework, what do we, what how, do, how do we think about that too? Yeah. So I don't know if you have thoughts about that. I know at one point when we had talked previously, the three of us, you had started talking about sort of alternative economies and, and that's sort of what I'm talking about as well. Yeah. Um, well I think one of the things also, yeah. Johanna, is that, art, that artist, the like um, the names we all know that we yeah. see who are wonderful, yeah, nothing, yeah, yeah. but nothing is more gutting than seeing them in the artist relief pool. Cause then I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Like, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. because again, that, 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 yeah. machine you enter extracts 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 you go from you need the money to keep up with the demand of your work and none of those and then by the time you're done paying out all the things you have to pay out you don't actually have a stable financial existence at the end of the day yeah. because you're living these massive projects to projects to projects that just don't give you a moment to rest or recuperate or be stable and so that it's like, I want to take some of the biennialists we see, and I want you to look at the artist relief pool and be like, then what are we doing? Because this right. can't be it. This cannot right. be it. And I think, I, yeah, I, I, I think right it's, now. It's such a good point. It's not like they, they won the lottery. Exactly. No. <laughs> yeah. It, they just have to keep up. And then oftentimes you hear some of the elder artists who have really been in that for a long time. Mm -hmm. At some point, they sometimes lose the agency. They have to fight for the right just to make the things they want to make and not the things that have served the institution or the market, right? It's a different, all of it is so vexing. I think, I think the impulse to go local is huge. Mm -hmm. I heard A.L. Steiner like years ago talk about like just needing to degrow everything, right? It was like coming off the like USC student scandal and it was just like, we have to stop this, this needless growth for no reason. It's counterproductive to the well-being of our communities. It doesn't work in the arts. And I think right now, everything is like, how do you degrow? How do you degrow? How do you degrow? And I think the impulse yeah. to go local is some some form of a degrowth to me, some form of a go deeper, not bigger, right? Like that thing really matters. I think with art projects, I am wondering a lot about the ethics of an art project right now, truly. And I mean this financially. I really mean this financially. In Baltimore, we used to say, how much money do you put in an art project if the local public schools don't have heat? Right? Mm -hmm. Like literally, what does that mean? What is the measure of this resource? And I think really having critical conversations about what we're expecting artists to do. And then I think at a very, very baseline, and we're seeing this everywhere in philanthropy at least, the artist line item budgets are all getting cut. They're just getting cut, right? There's like no, I think this, I hope that if we're flipping the world over, the new world starts with the artist. Mm -hmm. What is the person getting paid to do anything, period? at all and then how do you work from around from from that thing and i don't that it's still kind of happening we're still seeing artists getting invited to give talks and not be paid because they need the exposure and it's like the exposure for where right now exactly you know we're still watching artists get forced into like very predatory um commission agreements and i think building a new economy for the arts is going to take some time and a lot of like intellectual grit. In the meantime, if we're heading institutions, I think all of us need to know that we will be in the work of relief for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And every dime should be used to get into the hands of another person and quickly at that. While we make, while we leverage all these new tools to tell a more feasible art story. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just in a, yeah, I don't, it's grim. Everything just feels really grim on the funding side. So, so wh why is there such um, a distrust of art, right? So, you know, we, we were changed by the music we listen to. It can completely change one in an instant. And yet we don't want to support the musicians or we don't want to support 
the yeah. training or the symphony or the or the whatever. So you know, we're always as a culture sort of speaking out of two sides of our mouths. Yeah. And and it seems like one of the things you were talking about is how important it is. There's there's how do we put out the story which is about all the things actually that the arts do, which has been, you know, art is made by artists. And, 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 and why in this culture is there such a distrust of actually valuing that? It's along with education, obviously, and a lot of other things. But um, I, I don't know, I, I think about that a lot, like this distrust of beauty, this distrust of, um, or skepticism. Yeah. Um, I thought you would have a philosophical perspective on that, Dina. <laughs> it's funny, actually, and someone reminded me recently mm -hmm. that there is no distrust of rich artists. That no one questions it at all. Oh. No one, the, the artists we perceive to be rich. Who knows mm -hmm. what's happening behind closed doors with the ones, the mega celebrity. Mm -hmm. There's no distrust at all. No municipality no corporation, no private philanthropist, no foundation even flinches at what it costs to get a massive Jeff Koons sculpture in your plaza. And someone reminded me in lots of conversations about workers' rights, right? That it's a distrust of the poor or of the things that we cannot quantify within capitalism. That we don't trust working class people with money. It's why we govern it so badly. It's why we scrutinize every dollar that goes to the poor. And I think artists get lumped either into that struggling category or we just don't even know how to make sense of it. And so we can't trust them with it. We can't acknowledge it. We don't know how, it's why we hem and haw over every dollar in the art. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the sciences, tons of failures are made. Tons of bad questions are asked. Tons of problematic research is done. But the sciences are perceived to be a wealthy discipline. And so they can be entrusted with the money or they're perceived to be architectured around conditions of wealth. Mm. And I think we don't know how to talk about art within the conditions of wealth. And so I don't think people know how to trust you with money. More people have trusted me with money at United States Artists than ever at the contemporary. And the only difference was like two weeks, right? It, like, it was just two weeks. Like I was the same person two weeks ago, but there was a lot of people that wouldn't invest in a small town, tiny museum, mm -hmm. and my salary went up five times, and I became someone who could be entrusted with money, because now I make money, or I run money. Mm -hmm. And yeah, even artist relief, it was really wild how much we needed to prove that someone needed $5,000. And I've been in the room where we've given out hundreds of thousands of dollars to far wealthier artists and nobody questions what they're going to spend it on. There's not even a, no one even flinches. So I think it's, it's a scrutiny of like who we perceive to be poor or working class, or mm -hmm. we just don't know how to make sense of them because they're, we don't know the story of their money. And if you don't have it, then you don't, you won't know what to do with it. And so I think, I, I think that's the, dis I think artists just get lumped into this. And then I think the arts, yeah, I don't, I, I think we've actually, the like institutions that be, we've done a great disservice of just really limiting what, what is considered an art form and how to mm -hmm. think about art. And I actually, at one point when I got to USA, a lot of people asked about the disciplines, like they almost don't mm -hmm. always make a lot of sense because where would you even put Anne Hamilton, right? Who exists at the intersections of so many different things. And I think another thing that the siloing of the disciplines and the like holding people away, it doesn't help. It makes it feel like there's a, a line you cross and then you continue to become an expert. And I don't, I don't really think it's true. I really admired some of the younger artists that are really focusing in like the young adult space. Like mm -hmm. they're publishing kind of to young adults to get them to realize how accessible this is to them. Mm -hmm. so that we can at least raise a new generation not thinking that art is something you cannot access. And I think it's one of the few liberties I think of social media and the internet. It's just made it easier to give people access to things that they don't need to pay massive tuition to obtain or be directly related to an institution to know. And then beauty, I think beauty, yeah, I don't think money can buy you beauty. And I don't think money can buy culture. And I don't think, I think that also kind of, 
hems everything up a little bit. Um, I, I also think we've reached a, a very interesting visibility paradox, which is that to your point, Dina, what you're, what you're talking about is class, which is the thing we don't talk about in this country, but um, how that relates to what is the inherent promise of contemporary art is that it's destabilizing. So we, we ask artists to come in and destabilize our reality, yeah. but we, we don't want to destabilize too much. Yeah. So I think there's, you know, and, and the kind of rhetoric around contemporary and, and um, contemporary museums that, that traffic in working with contemporary artists, and that includes the one that I run, it's the idea, right, is you come in and you're asking an artist to sort of perform destabilization, but within the constructs of the thing that um, has to be held together financially and, and in terms of schedules and all these things. And I think, you know, in the past, that kind of destabilization applied mm -hmm. to broader ideological paradigms and culture. And now it's really kind of landed in the field itself. And so it's, um, somebody like Coons is a great example of somebody who can, of course, still kind of hold up the mantle of destabilization while really being entrenched in the, in the structure itself. The structure. So there's something really interesting about it. I mean, it's, it's funny, I, I made a book with um, Dominic Wilston and Shannon Jackson a few years ago called Public Servants. And what it aimed to do was just to get back to this very first conversation we started with was to dismantle the idea that you have to that you could find quantifiable effects, that an artist could come in, that the Astro Gates could solve the housing crisis, yeah. that, um, that you know, Simone Lee could change the health um, system. And to really reinscribe the idea that actually what artists do is symbolic work and that symbolic work yeah. at moments like this is really important. Profoundly um, important. So I, I think there's something really interesting about an incompatibility around this idea of destabilization um, or kind of rupture that we ask artists to perform, um, but then we can't, we can't accommodate. And that's what's happening all over this country. Yeah. So we're, we're watching that happen. So I'm not, I, I don't know what I'm, I don't know where to go with that, but I, I find it sort of um, profound actually that that's where we are. Um, I don't know, but I think it's about class. I agree. I think it's about class. It's funny when the New York Times earlier this summer wrote about artist relief, they referred to artists as a working class group mm -hmm. or a largely working class group. And then the editors got really mad about it and they took it down. Oh, did they? And yeah, they like removed it. It just, it was live for like 40 minutes and then they like took it down and they, we inquired, we're like, what's so interesting? Huh. They're like, oh yeah, it's too big of a can of worms. We don't know. Did they know. take down piece or just that language? They took out the words working class labor group and then they just referred to them as a group huh. and they were like we can't say artists are working class and it's too complicated to say that because that's not the perception yeah and I'm like oh but it's the actuality right which is yeah. like most artists are working they are largely a working class labor group and I think it's because we really get hamstrung around choice right. and the arts right which is real you know, lots of working class labor groups have no choice, right? They have to work certain jobs to survive. Right. And it's like, but something about class and the arts and who is a maker and who is not. And if we can like get in there and get dirty and like move around and acknowledge that arts workers are a multi-classed group, are a multi-racial group, are a multi-everything group, and it needs different conditions for different groups. Again, back to their, like, there is no singular vernacular, like, there has to be different ways to work with different kinds of artists. And I think we can get somewhere, but artists and income like intertwined. If you are an artist who has made money and can talk about it, there is far less concern about investing in you. And it has likely nothing to do with the majesty of your work. It is about the infrastructure you are in. And mm -hmm. that is real. There are so many excellent artists. They just never get there. And mm -hmm. that, that, I, want, I hate that. Like I, I think it's an institution's jobs to, to be the infrastructure so the artist doesn't have to do it so badly. Mm -hmm. I think this is where the distrust is. Yeah. And track record. You know, we're phenomenally bad at taking, we're bad at like sitting with the unknown with not feeling oh, like everything so has to get resolved so mm -hmm. neatly, right? The United States is like woefully unable to deal with complicated things. Like we just can't do it. It's, you know, there was racial... You know, there was racial inequity and then there was a three-day civil rights parade and 
And then we moved on to a whole new world. And it's like, it was not like that at all. There's no resolution point. And I think in the arts, if we can't find the resolution point, again, Fiesta Gates is gonna save housing. Simone is gonna save healthcare. If we can't find, even if it's symbolic, if you can't locate the resolution point, it's so hard for people to put their money on the line or their reputations or their any kind of resource. I was actually, can I read this like real key stanza? That, uh, my favorite thing about my job at United States Artists is I have found poetry Twitter. It's like my favorite of all the Twitters where poets just post other poets work. And every night, if I don't go through some of poetry Twitter, I like will never fall asleep. But there's like this real key line, have patience with everything unresolved in your life and try to love the questions themselves. It is possible to live and not know. And it's like, how do, you, how do you get there as a sector? And how do you build the public's will around the arts? That really, that's the whole point, is that it is possible to live and to not know, and to just ask repeatedly. And maybe one day, if we're lucky, 100 years from now, a different generation might answer that question. But right now, it's just our job to keep asking it. Mm -hmm. And that that thing, try explaining that to someone who's like, what's going to be the ROI on my investment on this $40,000 project? And you're like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that part's hard. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, one of the things that all, all, every artist I know really works to cultivate is the space for not knowing. Totally. You know, and if you can't work from that, then really you can't make anything. And that we have to be able to hold the things that can't be quantifiable and to hold nuance and to hold yeah. contradiction, you know, yeah. and ambiguity. And, and that we're at such an intolerant time in the culture. We're so insisting on categories around everything and answers where there are no answers. Yeah. And, and, and it's a, so our taste for trust is for trusting anything that doesn't then fall within these categories is so hard to cultivate and um and help people you know just how do we trust each other right now yeah, yeah. it's also interesting as in i think one thing leadership and institutions could do it'll take time and i'm very bad at this i'm trying to get better about it in my own practice is like admitting that we do not know, right. you know? And I think I, I do it horribly. I don't know how often I say, I do not know. And I oftentimes I don't know, but I'm lying, right? Because someone has given me a big girl job to know. And it's been really interesting. You know, there was a moment, it was 11 days, right when our country was shutting down, where I think a lot of powerful people were willing to say, we do not know, like we don't know. There's no lifeguard on duty. Try everything you can. Just go. And everyone was so open for this fleeting moment to just try to build anything that felt like it was going to protect people and the planet and everything around us. And it is so far away from that now. You know, we are actively still living in a global pandemic on the brink of what feels like a civil war, like American imperialism is crumbling around us. And people with power still feel like they have to know. And the problem is when you make it up because you're not willing to admit you do not know, someone gets hurt in that, right? Like there's no way. And so I think I'm trying to learn that from artists as a non-maker in my job to just admit, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I have to take time to figure it out. And if we can't find the solution, what are we gonna do in the meantime? Can we kick this problem down? Can we absorb the problem so it becomes so part of our condition that we just figure out how to move around it rather than try to solve it? Like in the instance of racism, right? Like how do you solve that thing? You don't, you just acknowledge and you take it inside and then you figure out how to live with it so that we do as little harm as possible. But I don't, it's really hard. I actually tried two weeks ago to tell a funder I did not know. I'm a massive project that is very scary and it did not go well, you know, it really was, but we pay you to know, but we outsource this to you to know. And it's like, oh, that's right, that's right. Well, and then, and then, you know, it's like, how do you involve them in your process of thinking to engage with it so that the not knowing is not a not knowing, but it's an active process. Yeah. And, and it's actually, that means you're asking them to actually have a relationship for, with you and to step out of this position of expertise into a place of experience and how to, and, and, and at every level that needs to happen yeah. um, in an institution, in the funding structures, 
you know, how do we no one no there's no expertise on what's going on. No. We've never been here before. Yeah. But if we could bring that energy into the boardroom at every institution across this country, this reimagining will not feel so daunting. Mm -hmm. It won't feel so hard because we'll just admit we're not going to figure it out right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems like we've gotten to the, <laughs> the, the sort of legitimate place of, um, of maybe stopping and um, leaving a, a part two, maybe up in the air. Um, but thank you, Dina. It's really terrific to, to have your perspective and, and also just your humanity um, today.